I'm James Helder. Welcome to Full Core Football 24. I'm in the Chelsea studio today. It's fantastic to be here with me. I've got Chelsea and Jamaican legend, none other than Frank Sinclair. Great to see you, Frank. How are you doing, James? You all right? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. I've got to say, this is some ground and some stadium. Thank you to you and Chelsea for, for allowing us access today. No, my pleasure. Uh, we, we are a family club and uh, we always you know, look after our own. And obviously, me having a history with the football club now back here working for the TV, um, keeps me really busy and I enjoy talking about the football, uh, you know, as well as different roles in the game as well. We'll get on to that in the future. I want to go back memory lane a little bit. I want to talk yeah. about you pre-academy before you made the decision to sign to Chelsea, starting out on your football journey. Could you give us a little bit of, of an insight to how you got going? Yeah, well, um, I started off, obviously, I'm a, I'm a South London boy originally. So I started off playing football uh, down Wandsworth Road. There was a boys club called Heathbrook which was um, just around the back of Battersea, really. And I, I come from, you know, Clapham, Clapham Northway, but it was quite a local club to me uh, down Wandsworth Road. So, you know, I was playing football there. I also used to do a bit of boxing on a Saturday as well, um, you know, following my, my brother's footsteps because my brother was an amateur boxer, fought from Fitzroy Lodge for quite a few years, but didn't, didn't go pro. So, you know, I was doing a bit of both and just seemed to, be more natural to play football. So played football, you know, up until the age of under nines, under tens uh, for the local team and then got an opportunity to go on trial at Chelsea. I remember the same week I got asked to go to Arsenal and Wimbledon uh, at the same time. So I went to all three clubs in one week and for some reason, you know, Chelsea seemed to be the fit for me. So I started training there regularly and, and playing for them from the age of 11. Spotted at playing for Pim Pimlico Comprehensive. How much of a big step up was it from the grassroots level to then being part of the academy set up at Chelsea? Yeah, it was massive, um, especially, you know, the, the history of the football club, even if you go back to the 70s and stuff, the likes of Ray Wilkins um, and other players like that that had come through Chelsea's academy uh, into the first team and been successful. You know, I had uh, someone that I was following in the, in the same footsteps, Alan Hudson, who was uh, went to the same school as me as well. And, you know, we were the only two that, went from Pimlico School and went on to play for Chelsea uh, through the academy route. So um, I knew the history behind it. I knew how difficult it would obviously be. Could see the talent at the football club straight away when I came in. There was players from, from you know, wider abroad of, of London, um, but some some quality players. So it was tough at first to get used to, but, you know, we had a coach in Gwyn Williams who was really... Uh, the one that brought through all the players when you go back through the mid nineties and stuff. There was, you know, the like the likes of Eddie Newton, Jody Morris, myself, Michael Dubry, Andy Myers. You know, the list is as long as my arm of players that were were under his wing and and he brought through to the first team. So it was it was a tradition at the football club that um, players were coming through, and um, obviously, you know, I, I became part of that. What was it like when you found out that? you were going to be offered a professional contract for Chelsea. How did that conversation go and what was the sort of, what was the mood like in the Sinclair household? Yeah, nerve wracking, obviously, you know, I didn't have the real um, family support as in being able to take me to football. So from the age of 11, really, I was leaving school, um, you know, three, four o'clock, going home, quickly getting changed, making my own way on the underground from Clapham North Station all the way over to Fulham Broadway, which used to take me an hour, close to an hour to do that. And um, and then obviously, you know, um, train and then sometimes I'd be getting home like close to 11 o'clock the same night and going to school the next day. So I was really responsible from a young age. Um, I think the streets were a bit more safer than they are to, nowadays to, for schoolboys to be taking the underground on your own and, and being responsible for yourself. So, you know, it was something that I was quite used to doing. A lot of the players were doing it at the time. Um, so my family was excited, but obviously my mum being a nurse, she, she was a nurse, uh, came over from Jamaica as a nurse and, and worked at Roehampton Hospital for many years. She, she'd done long hours, so I knew she was, you know, providing for me the best she could and I had to really look after myself. So it was it was difficult at times, but, um, you know, I showed that I had the dedication and, and wanted to do um, uh, what I wanted to do and, and knew what I wanted to do, which was more important. So coming up to, you know, answering your question on, on me becoming a professional footballer, um, I had a feeling that 
I was I had a good chance of making it. Obviously, you could tell by the feedback you got off of the coaches in the academy. And um, you know, when the year that it was our year, they only took on myself and Eddie Newton, who obviously you know had a great career at Chelsea as well with the two out of probably you know 10 11 players so very fortunate to get a contract and it just showed what the football club thought of us was it hard for you knowing that you'd got a contract and some of the boys you'd been around for five six seven years for instance mm. hadn't been able to make that step up that next that next level to go and take themselves into the professional game yeah 100 percent. i mean for every successful story there is in football of players having good careers there's probably 50 to 100 players that didn't make it and you know those are the ratios you have in football that's how hard the industry is so um you know like you said there was players that i'd I'd known from the age of 11 to 16 that were getting disappointed on the same day that I was achieving, you know, a dream for myself to become um, a scholarship, uh, to get a, an apprenticeship at the football club um, at the age of 16. So that was tough for some players. You know, you saw some players visibly, visibly um, upset um, and, you know, you try to console them and, and encourage them that. It is about opinions, football, and you can also go somewhere else and, and still get what you're after. So, yeah, it was tough times for some certain players, yeah. They're coming through the Chelsea ranks. I mean, Bobby Campbell then decided that you were good enough to get your professional debut in the first team. Can you talk me through that that moment? Yeah, really excited, obviously. Um, when I was, when I was uh, 17 going on to 18, you know, I was training quite regularly with the first team and I thought I was good enough then as you are as a young kid you're confident with it, of your own ability and you just want the opportunity and then you know initially I got a phone call to say that he wanted me to go on loan to West Brom and Bobby Gould was the manager you know famously managed uh, Wimbledon to FA Cup final and stuff like that and Bobby Gould was the manager of West Bromwich Albion at the time and he wanted me to go there on loan and I, I didn't really want to go to be honest because I thought I was pretty close to getting in the first team maybe two or three injuries away from getting an opportunity to play. So um, I didn't want to go, but I was told part of your development, you need to go and play first team football somewhere else. And then when you've, uh, when you've achieved that, then come back and, and obviously you'll get an opportunity. So I did go to West Brom. Um, I proved that, you know, I was good enough to play first team football. It was a massive club, even though they were in the old second division at the time, they were still getting 30 to 40,000 home games. So it was a massive club to go and, and obviously get that experience in playing football. Um, and then I came back to Chelsea and, and started, you know, training more with the first First team and then obviously I got the opportunity to play in the first team towards the back end of my first season as a professional I think I played the last three games of the season um, you know my my actual debut was at Stamford Bridge uh, played against Luton Town and it was at the time I think it was the youngest ever back four that Chelsea had ever fielded there was uh, myself at left back um, Jason Cundy and David Lee, the two centre halves, were 21, and Gareth Hall was the right back, was 22, Welsh international Gareth Hall. So it was one of the youngest ever back fours that Chelsea ever played. So came into that game, and um, we were 3 0 down at half time, which was unbelievable because I thought to myself, you know, you start to have a bit of self doubt. Is it because I'm in the team? Why, why we weren't doing so well? But Graham Lasso got sent off in that game for punching someone. I remember he was playing left side midfield, and then uh, we went with 10 men in the second half and we ended up drawing the game three all. So it went from all types of different emotions and I realised that this is what, you know, first team football is all about. I was thrown in at the deep end and, and you know, it, on my debut, it ended up being not a bad story of Chelsea coming back with 10 men to draw. So, um, yeah, that was a bit of a baptism of fire. What was Chelsea like at that time? You've always had the glamour of the King's Road, even from the older players, the likes of Jason Cundy and, and Osgood. What was it What was it like to be around and in the club in that Ken Bates era? Yeah, well, you know, it's totally different to how Chelsea is now. I think at the time, you know, you had your hardcore supporters that were, you know, from a similar background to players that were probably coming through the ranks and stuff, you know, and um, and obviously, you know, the club was well supported, um, but more, it was more about your effort, what you put in, you know, to wear the 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 Chelsea's lying on on your chest and give a hundred percent. You know that's what, what the supporters were looking for in them days. And I think it wasn't really until uh, Glenn Hoddle joined the football club. 
um, in in the early 90s, you know, 93, I think he came that to... That was as like a, a player firstly, initially. Yeah, he came it? in as a player. I mean, it had been around... Um, Glenn had been around the football club for about four or five months uh, recovering from a knee injury. And um, it obviously come back from Monaco. It was towards, towards the latter end of his, his career and he started training with us. And then, you know, he was trying to recover from a knee injury. So he was in and around the players quite a bit. And then he got the opportunity to be the uh, the player manager. So I think that was the start of where this new brand of football came in at Chelsea because Glenn had been um, at Swindon previously, played really good football and got Swindon promoted to the Premier League by playing a sweeper system that not many not many teams were playing in England and not certainly managers weren't playing that way as, as their philosophy. So he came to Chelsea with that idea, obviously with better players and I thought he was really successful and um, you know, it wasn't until he obviously left Chelsea to go and manage England. I think we were going in a in the right direction under Glenn Hoddle with him playing the young players. A nice brand of football that Chelsea hadn't seen probably since the seventies. And um and obviously, you know, um Rude Hullet went on from there and, and took it to another level. In between sort of Bobby Campbell leaving and Glenn Hoddle joining, you had Ian Porterfield at the club, David yeah. Webb. Do you feel that it took Glenn Hoddle to come in for you to really establish yourself, if you like, or get that that, that momentum in the team? I, f I think, um, you know, uh, working under Ian Porterfield and Bobby Campbell, to an extent, it was about you were good enough to play, just go out and show what you can do. And I think it weren't until Glenn Hoddle took over, really, that you started to learn the tactical game the side of the game you know he had he was he, he thought about the game quite a lot and uh, he was right in depth with his with his tactics for games and and that's when i started to to take on you know that sort of education in in football so um you know definitely he had a massive role in my career and improving me as a player i think i would have been about 21 at the time um 22 21 20 going on 22 when when glenn was coaching me um, and improving me as a player technically as well. I'd never really had that before because, you know, Chelsea's history was they they found good players, threw them in at the deep end, they survived and made a career out of it and done the best they could. And uh, I think, you know, it was Glenn that came in and started to really improve the whole football club, as in tactically and, and, and um, individually with players as well. Is that that time that... Chelsea started to get a bit more success on the pitch, getting to the first cup final in sort of fifth 94. in ninety four. Yeah. How did it feel to be around the squad and involved in that that sort of historical moment for Chelsea? Yeah, I felt I felt um privileged but also excited about it because um, you know, being at the football club from the age of eleven, knowing what um, you know, the seventies, the history of the football club beforehand, you know, every time you used to go into the football club there was always people coming up and talking about your Osgoods, your your Bonettis and people like that from the seventies. So it got a bit frustrating at certain times because you wanted them to start talking about the success that I was gonna be a part of. And I knew we were a sleeping giant as a football club. Obviously for me, you know, the most fashionable club at the time in London you know the King's Road and, and all that that comes with it so you know I was really excited when we started to achieve stuff obviously um, getting to the first cup final in 94 um, against Man United it was uh, disappointing on the day but I think we achieved so much that season because um, you know, I think we were punching above our weight to even get to a final. We we actually beat Man United. We'd done the only team to do the double over Man United that season, beat them home and away. So we went into that game quite confidently. But I think, you know, the occasion got to the players, I think. Um, on the day, obviously, we ended up losing 4-0, but it was 0-0 at half time. We had hit the crossbar. Um, Gavin Peacock had and I think you know two inches lower and we go into that into that second half one nil up and we'd beaten one nil in both games in in the league so I think it would have been a different story on the day but I just thought there wasn't enough experience of playing in cup finals and stuff I think the only person we had had that played in the final before was on the pitch was Dennis Wise who was obviously the captain um, had done it before with with Wimbledon so um, yeah that was it was a learning curve for us, I thought we grew from that, and obviously, you know, the club started to um, realise that we could we could um, compete against you know the best in the country. This was round about the time we saw we saw a massive influx of foreign talent come into the Premier League. Players that 
that were new to a lot of the fans of the Premier League and opened up a whole new culture and a whole new philosophy of football. Mm. What was it like as an as a an English born Jamaican player to be around that whole scene? Yeah, it was um it was again exciting, you know, we you know, it was like a revolving door the 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 foreign players that was coming into Chelsea at the time under Glenn Hoddle we signed the likes of Dan Petrescu, uh Rude Hullet obviously, um you know, Mark Hughes. So we were signing, you know, a couple of players that were sort of like at you know the the pinnacle of their careers, but we were also bringing in top international players as well at the same time, Tor Andre Flo and people like that. And um, Robbie Di Matteo came to the club under Rude Hullet and obviously one of the one of the biggest foreign exports um, imports, sorry, into into Chelsea Football Club. Uh, Gianfranco Zola came to the club as well. So to be training with these boys every day, you just had to step up everything you'd done, you know, to a new level, and it improved me as a player being. Uh, you know, training day in, day out with these players and not only what you was doing on the training pitch, but the way you started to look after yourself off the pitch as well because they came with, you know, different traditions of how, you know, healthy eating, looking after yourself and all that side of it that we'd never really had in English football. And, you know, everyone, you know, didn't really look after yourselves as in diets and stuff. You just ate what you wanted and, and trained as hard as you could to keep fit, basically. Let's talk a little bit about the season after, I mean, getting to the FA Cup final against playing that Middlesbrough team. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the plaudits of that Middlesbrough team had won that season. Talk us through your experience and, and that day of the final of the FA Cup. Um, well, the the first initial uh, memory that I'd think about would be the semi-final that we played at Highbury against Wimbledon. It was probably the draw that we didn't want um, in the semi-final over one game at Highbury. And obviously Wimbledon, they had the likes of Vinnie Jones, um, John Fashionu, people like that. Right, crazy gang in full crazy effect. Gang, basically, uh, uh, we knew we was going to have a tough afternoon. And um, obviously going into that game, I was really nervous because off the back of the 94 Cup final, for me, um, I needed to avenge that by winning the trophy to try and put that that day to bed. So I was, myself and Eddie Newton were two players, young players that played in the 94 final that was playing in the semi-final and we, we both was, you know, we used to share rooms together. So we spoke all the time about, you know, what we wanted to achieve in the game and how important it was to go back to Wembley and win an FA Cup to get rid of, um, you know, that hoodoo of 94. So, you know, we went into that game and I remember it, um, Wimbledon screaming as we're going down the tunnel to, to, to uh, go out for the the warm up and that, and Wimbledon were sort of like outside our change room screaming like nutcases. It was like it was like they'd let the 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 lunatic asylum free for the day. Do you know what I mean? Um, as they were coming out, obviously you know trying to get in our reds before the game started, and Rudol it went out there and and sort of like stood in front of them all, and they all just sort of like eased off. And and Rudol always says in his interviews that day that he went out there and faced them, we won the semi final because they all melted straight away with, you know, Rude being such a legend of the game he was. So we went out and obviously we beat them 2-0 comfortably on the day and uh, got ourselves to a final against a Middlesbrough side who, again, was full of, you know, some top foreign players, Ravinelli um, in that side and, and other players that... Janino, Emerson. Janino, Emerson, yeah, the Brazilian Emerson as well. Brian Robson was obviously the manager of, of them and, and Viv Anderson was his assistant, you know, two, two legends of the games in their own right as well. So we knew it was going to be a tough game uh, for a one-off game, but obviously Robert, Robbie Di Matteo scores that goal after about... 28 seconds or something like that. I think it was even shorter than that. And that settled us right down. And we, we played good football in the day. And for me, it was a more comfortable afternoon than we expected. And obviously brought the first trophy back to Chelsea in, what was it, 28 years or so. So, you know, for me, it was a very proud moment. But also, you know, it, it gave me the opportunity to get rid of, you know, those demons from 94, three years earlier when, when we got beat by Man United. I want to ask you a question now. When was the first time you saw John Terry uh, as a player? When did you first notice him? Yeah, John was John was uh, obviously playing in, in the youth team. And at the time, I, I used to watch. I used to go over sometimes and just watch the youth team play and stuff like that, along with the other players, give them a little bit of support. And he used to be a midfield player. I remember him playing central midfield. Um, he wasn't the biggest at the time either, so you didn't really see him as a centre-half at the time. And I mean, if someone had bet me 
that he was going to have the career after watching him just playing in the youth team that he was going to go on to have at Chelsea. I would have probably said they were crazy, do you know what I mean, at the time. And then, you know, I had a, a fairly um, decent relationship with John because he used to clean my boots as an apprentice growing up. So, you know, he used to come to me at Christmas for his 50 quid as a bonus and stuff like that. I should get that money back off him now, really, <laughs> and stuff. But, um, yeah, so, you know, John always says in whenever he gives, whenever he does, stories about um, growing up as an, an apprentice at the club that he, uh, he he got the raw end of the stick with me because I was forever giving him stick and I was a hard taskmaster apparently at the time and um, but yeah he obviously started playing in the reserves and stuff and I sort of like, I didn't really get him playing in the first team because I'd left the club the year that he started training and playing with the first team so I missed him I missed playing with him in the first team at Chelsea um, obviously you know a tradition of players going out so younger players could get their opportunity that I had had before me. Uh, unfortunately for me, it was uh, I left when, when he was coming through.